Welcome to our webinar today on visual reporting and analysis. This webinar is a follow-on to a TDWI webinar hosted by Wayne Eckerson back in January. Uh, Advisor Solutions was a sponsor of Wayne's research, and we're very happy to continue the discussion today. Thanks for taking the time to join us. My name is Kim, and I'm joined by our presenter today, Doug Cogswell. Hi, everybody. Just a quick bio on Doug. Uh, Doug is current president and CEO of Advisor Solutions. He has 15 years of experience in the business intelligence sector, along with extensive strategy consulting experience for a variety of clients. Uh, he has come to be known as an emerging growth software expert through his involvement with a number of different companies, including Palindrome Software, Seagate Software, Visual Insights, and most recently Advisor, which he spun out of Bell Labs several years ago. He has a physics and engineering background, a Harvard, Harvard MBA, and all of that, his uh, credentials, his experience in the software world, um, and technical background um, makes him highly regarded as a very strong strategic thinker and a thought leader in the industry. And we're very happy to have him here. Well, thanks for the uh, kind words and the uh, pictures of human interest on the slide. Um, today we're going to focus on why visual reporting and analysis. What is it? What benefits do it provide? We're going to uh, summarize some of the key, D key TDWI research points and then go through three examples of application, uh, first with Dartmouth College, uh, second with a major airline, and uh, third with uh, work with Salesforce.com pipeline analysis. Just for your information, we will, of course, have some time for question and answers at the end of the webinar. And there are several ways that you can get your questions to us. You can use the chat panel that you see at the right-hand corner of your GoToMeeting screen. Or if you're into tweeting, you can uh, use our Twitter uh, hashtag at hashtag VizAnn for visual analysis. Or uh, you can feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your question live at the end of the webinar. And uh, the all-important question, will the webinar and slides be available uh, afterwards? Yes, we are recording the webinar and we will make both the webinar and slides available on our website. So let's uh, jump into the content. Um, and it, this is going to run about 30 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of that. So the, the main problem or, or benefit, the other side of that, that visual reporting and analysis covers is what we call the cycle of pain. And, and it comes in two forms. The first is custom report requests. And, and we see all the time in our clients that an end user group or end user has some question. Uh, they submit a, a, question, a query to IT who runs some run of the database and gives a report back. Usually it's backlog, so it's a week or two. It begs another question because maybe the, the data doesn't show exactly what they thought, so they modify the question. It goes back through the cycle, which is hard to collaborate that way, and it creates a lot of frustration. The other form of the cycle of pain we see all the time is downloading data into Excel extracts, which is usually a formatted one table. Uh, you slice and dice it, but it's hard to slice and dice across a lot of parameters in Excel. It's time consuming. You don't have all the data because some of it's in other tables you didn't get. Hard to show management. Uh, you've got this spreadsheet. They ask a question. You have to recut it. It's just not easy to do. And one of the worst things as we see is this ends up with a shadow data system. So it's hard to get this data in the first place. So three months later, you know, in May, uh, you're still working with the same data, but it's now dated uh, because time has progressed. So that's, I think, the crux of what visual reporting and analysis is aimed at uh, addressing. And um, the first thing it does uh, is, if you look at this as a model of data, uh, there's a set of different tables, uh, a typical business problem, demographic tables. This might be a list of customers. There might be some addresses. There might be some other descriptive tables. There may be other ratings and scores. They've been sent different promotions over time in different forms. And they've done different kinds of transactions, maybe uh, off the website, maybe through the sales team. And the first thing uh, that these, uh, these new approaches do is they bring the data into memory. So a big part of this is in-memory data management. And then the tables are uh, linked together, uh, so they basically become an integrated uh, interactive unit. And this could be, in one case, it might be in one Excel sheet. So it could be one table. In some cases, it might be 100 tables. They get loaded from an Oracle database every night. And the beauty of this is, is when a selection is made, maybe on a set of transactions in the transactions table, it updates the customer table for the people who made those transactions, updates the promotions table for the people who 
had those transactions who got those promotions, then you could select a set of promotions, and you're then intersecting you know, the people who got the promotions with the kinds of purchases they made, and you've got the list of people all across the tables. And so this enables you know, easy answers to questions. And on top of the in memory pool, uh, what we are doing is putting a very strong visualization capability that shows the data across all these tables, but also lets you interact with it. So the, the way to query the data is by clicking on and selecting what you see on the screen versus going back and doing queries against the data. And the in-memory updates are all happening behind the scenes under the covers. We're going to take a, a look at just a minute, uh, first case, Dartmouth College. Uh, a question they might ask is, do we have the top-rated prospects? This is a fundraising example. Who aren't staffed? Are, are they covered? Uh, who are they? Uh, what, what might uh, the answers to do to help get um, more uh, fundraising out of those people? So here's actually a comment made by Judy Doherty from Dartmouth College, who is an advisor customer. Uh, and this is taken directly from the TDWI report. Uh, she stated that the combination of data discovery and visualization enables users to uncover hidden relationships that they didn't know existed. I'll often hear, why didn't we have this data before? In fact, they did have it in a report. They just didn't see it. So, Doug, let's take a look and see what Dartmouth is doing. So, great. So, I'm opening up a web-based, uh, we would call this a project or a dashboard. Uh, and this is disguised data. It's, it's not their data, but it's, it's the story uh, is very similar. Uh, the project comes up with a set of pages. Here we're looking at uh, a page on data on the prospects. It's got a list of all the prospects. Uh, there's 93,743 of them. There's some information like their name, how much they've given, uh, some descriptive characteristics about how they're affiliated, where they live, and so forth. So this could be anything. It could have phone numbers and emails and the like. And then there's some filters up here, so you can drop the data down, like maybe you're only interested in alumni and so forth. Then uh, a project uh, would typically have a set of pages like this. Uh, these are pages that describe the people, um, how they're affiliated, where they live, with degrees, sports, and then there's some giving history over on the right. So Kim, let's, uh, let's work out a scenario here. What do we want to do? Well, the question you asked uh, just a few minutes ago was, do we have top-rated prospects who are not staffed, and who are they? So. Um, Let's, let's try to answer that one. So good. So this is organized that we want ratings. Uh, so there's a page on ratings. So this is going to take this list of 93,743 people and show different attributes about how they're rated. And the top is a bar chart. Uh, so it's showing, uh, this is a, a visual report. Um, it's showing uh, the number of people by rating level. Uh, so it's a 50 million or more. Uh, there's 166 people. And then it goes on down to the, the one on the right, the nine rating. Uh, Twenty-five to fifty thousand uh, dollars. There's uh, 19, eighteen thousand nine hundred forty-nine people, and then there's a big group on the, the left uh, on rated, which is thirty-eight thousand, roughly uh, forty-one percent of the population actually don't have a rating. So this is this is a visual report. It's taking that same data we saw on the first page, but it's laying it out so you can actually see graphically uh, the, the relative magnitude. We're using color consistently. We're colored by the ratings. So the hotter colors are always uh, the higher ratings, and the cooler colors are the lower ratings, and the purple are the unrated. And then um, this is one of Wayne's principles to balance graphics with, with text and detail. So uh, on the right, we actually have a list of everybody uh, with a tally up of how many there are. Great. So uh, I want to look at my top rating prospects. So as I see, there's several different categories. Um, I think we'll definitely we start at the top at the 50 million. Let's go down all the way down to 500,000 and up. So five okay. different categories there. OK, so we have a visual report. Now we're going to make a selection on it. Uh, so the way we do that is we just take the mouse and drag it across the five categories in the bar chart we want. And we've then selected 6,306 people who are in those five rating groups. Uh, and there's, the list has changed, so the names of those people and, and the other charts have updated as well. And let's, um, let's now just get rid of everybody else, clean the charts up, so I can go up here and exclude the unselected and drop them out of the population. OK, so the first thing that jumps out immediately to me as I'm looking at my top-rated prospects is on that primary staff chart in the middle there, a big null bar. Um, I can't help but notice it. So to me, so those are the uh, unstaffed operated prospects? Well, that's actually a good example of a visual discovery. So you, you might not have known how big this was if you saw this in a report, but when you see it in a chart like this, it jumps. And it's actually 
when you put the mouse on the bar, there's 1,567 top-rated prospects, or 24.8% who aren't staffed. And these others are the, are the staff. So if you move down, uh, uh, Mel uh, oh, Tanner Tinker here has uh, 286, and these are the actual. So these are the staff ones that breaks that out. Okay, great. Well, let's look at the let's look at those that aren't staffed. Can we uh, drill down into that group? So let's do visual selection again. I'm going to just click on the bar and get rid of everything else, exclude from up here. I'm down to 1,567 unstaffed, top-rated prospects, and here's the list of who they are. OK, well, when I look at that list, uh, we've got some pretty large donors in that list. Um, looks like Camelia Snyder, right at the top, has given over $40 million. Um, there's another one, Elaine Perano, who's given $4.4 million, several, several at least 10 or 15 who's, who have given over a million. So these are major donors that are not staffed. So if we're going to now continue with this whole visual discovery, what well, question would be maybe these people have given you know, back in time and haven't given recently. So maybe we should look at the giving history. I think that's a great idea. So to do that, we click on the giving history page. Now this page is actually tied to the gift transactions. So you know every every person who's been a donor uh, will have had you know a hundred or a thousand or fifty transactions. So this is off a different table, but it's linked. So the fifteen hundred and sixty-seven people we have selected, we're now showing the sum of their gifts over time from nineteen eighty-seven up to two thousand and eleven. And it's actually a good story for this group. Um, they've been giving three million a year roughly in the the mid 90s uh, it's now up into the you know 5 6 million a year uh, range lately 11 is you know obviously still in progress um, but that's gets good news for this group yeah this is definitely a group worth uh, digging a little deep, more deeply into to try to get a better feel for who they are uh, how they're giving and whether or not they should uh, should get some more of our attention so let's do some some more just drive down and do some visual analysis so maybe let's take a look at cuz the list is also selectable if i clicked on Elaine Pirano, she's given $4 million. If I click her, the charts will now update to show her giving history. Um, this is off her gift transactions. And uh, she actually uh, didn't give a whole lot until 2000. Then she jumped up and was giving you know, 600 to 900000 a year for a few years and fell off. Um, then came back at a lower level and has given nothing uh, in, in 11. And this is a fiscal year ending June 30th. So this is pretty far into the year. Uh, yeah, so I think there's Probably, uh, if I had some time, I'd want to dig a little more deeply into uh, just what she's, what other things she's, how else well she's affiliated with the college. Maybe look at some of her different activities and and other things because it looks like she, you know, had a connection to the college at one time and might be worth investing some time in and assigning someone to to at least have some initial conversations to see what she's up to. Right, so that would actually be another next step. And we, just to show the flexibility here, let's look at another one. Uh, just Chico uh, uh, Anafia is a, another seven-figure donor. If I click on her, I can see the pattern, different pattern. Um, had been giving, you know, 60, 100,000 a year. Has actually been off recently. Uh, would be another person you probably want to staff. Um, so another thing might be also, if you want to look at this group, uh, another question might be, where do they actually live? Um, so we can go one of these other pages. There's a map view, and there's a you can look at uh, in regions and, and lists. You know, Doug. Before you jump to the map, uh, the thing that I find so amazing is that in just a few minutes, we went from a group of 93 over 93,000 down to Elaine Carano or Chico individuals, and saw their individual giving patterns, and uh, could evaluate whether or not they might be people that we would want to assign to staff to take some action. Uh, that that is absolutely amazing. Well, that's the whole idea of the visual reporting and analysis, and what makes this fundamentally different than a reporting or a scorecard system, where we literally have all the data here. So we're spinning, you know, kind of pivoting across tables and getting back to that in-memory model. And that's the beauty of what this uh, technology that TDWI has been writing about does. So let's take a look at the map then. Yeah. So now we're looking at uh, this is just a view of where those roughly 1,500 people live. Um, you know, some patterns come out. Now, these are each cities. Uh, they're sized by how many are in it. There's 142 in New York. Um, you can see the hotter colors. Uh, looks like there's some up in you know, the New England area. Boston's got 27. There's a group in the Bay Area. So like there's a group down here in South Florida, uh, smaller in Chicago and Midwest. We might want to say, just to you know, finish this exercise, let's grab the ones in Florida. Maybe our president's going down there. We want to pick up. So I get a sweep on the map across the ones in Florida. I grab them, uh, go back to my first page. Uh, I've got 98 people. Uh, this is now the list of the 98. 
uh, I can export the list out to Excel or back to a database and you know, give it to the event coordinator. And, and you could have the addresses, could have addresses, could have phone numbers, and whatever's in the database we could show here. Uh, that's sort of the first example. Uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint and pick up the story where it left off. So just to summarize um, the Dartmouth College example, and they're using this in a number of different areas, but we saw visual reporting uh, where we took the numbers and we saw it in a bar chart, easy to see the ratings, visual discovery. We might not have even thought there were that many uh, unstaffed, operated prospects. And again, this is disguised data, uh, so it's not a, specifically uh, to Dartmouth at this point, uh, but it's the kind of thing they would do. And then we did visual analysis to drill down in on an individual donor and try to understand their patterns. And then we realized that let's, uh, let's follow up with the group in, in Florida. And this, this is, kills the cycle of pain because people can, two people can sit in a room and, and kind of in speed of thought do this kind of analysis. And uh, Dharma's examples would be uh, they found new large donors. Uh, they've been able to work on their, uh, their appeals and their, their messaging to their alumni group. They've been able to work on uh, proposal moves and kind of major giving staff performance. Uh, they use this in alumni relations, and we're doing some work on the energy and other other areas of the, the school as well. So it's it's been in a lot of areas, and the benefits have been really strong. Yeah, that demo really illustrates some of uh, Wayne's observations that he made in his TDWI report about the key some of the key benefits of using using visual analysis. Um, the first, obviously, is that it, it it surfaces patterns. It allows you to really see the stories that are hidden in your data. Um, uh, you know, it was we went from a from a list of donors to um, to a map uh, which showed where they live to charts illustrating their various giving history. So it took uh, lots of reports that could have been overwhelming with a lot uh, huge masses of data and consolidated them in a very logical presentation that was easy to uh, easy to understand. And that's actually one of Wayne's key points was to get from summary to detail in, in no more than three clicks, uh, which you saw happen there. Yeah, and then um, really importantly, it leaves impressions in people's heads. So I, you know, the, the map, the picture of the concentrations in the Northeast, in Florida, on the West Coast, uh, the trends in the giving history really stayed in my head. And uh, whether I remember the numbers behind them or not isn't important, but I can remember the trends. So all of that combines to lead to better and faster decision making. Yeah, and the next actual quote picks up on that leaving impressions in, in people's heads, which is a kind of a whole idea of this visual display. So Judy Doherty once again stated, the first time I saw a heat map, I thought, no one's going to be able to understand these things. In fact, heat maps have proven incredibly powerful in their ability to combine and reflect multiple dimensions. So let's look at another example that's more kind of a visual display. Uh, this is coming from the airline industry. Um, this is a, a, obviously a map of the U.S. with something's graph. So, so Kim, what do you see when you look at this, this chart? I see some bold colors. That's I good. see some um, columns, colorful columns of varying heights, and I see actually a very colorful web or network of lines. That's good. So each of these columns is an airport. For example, if I put this on, this is Miami uh, Airport, and it's this, what we're sizing is over the last uh, five days, uh, the total number of flights that were oversold, and then it's colored by the average oversell of each flight. So bigger, hotter color things are bad, and smaller, cooler color things are good. Uh, so what do you see when yeah. you know that? So I see definitely issues in the Northeast. The big right. Fall For example, form. this is Boston. It's got 75 oversold flights, and it, it's, it's a hotter color, so it's got a problem. It looks like there's also stuff going on at uh, Washington, Reagan, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, LaGuardia, and so forth. So this is the kind of information that was coming out uh, in uh, 80, 100 pages of PDF reports. So uh, to try to sort through this is really hard. And the issue isn't the, the worst oversold flights, it's where there's collections of them. Uh, like in this case, you can quickly see that I've got a problem in the Northeast. I don't have a problem brewing in the West, and, and the South isn't so bad. And then you can click on um, one of these. Let's just select Boston. Um, so can, when I click Boston, what do you then see? Well, I see several different uh, flight segments, um, very hot colors, and actually some variance in the width of those uh, lines. So again, what these are the flight segments. So this is Boston. We're just looking at the originating airport here to Dallas, uh, to Miami, 
Uh, the wider lines have more oversold flights. The hotter color ones, the flights are in worse condition. Uh, so you actually see that you know Chicago has got a bunch, but they're not as bad as the ones to uh, Dallas and to Miami. And again, uh, Wayne's principle. You got a graphic here that you know, got this uh, view to management. Uh, and then you can go to the next page where you actually got the flight record details. Uh, there's a 190 of them, so it's a significant number in that period. I can right-click on the, uh, the, the report, uh, send it to my desktop, and I've now got the data out of Advisor uh, in Excel. Uh, let Excel open up here, and uh, I could you know, take this to my operating people or do whatever I need to adjust some flights in these markets. And again, this is um, another example of the use of uh, visual discovery and reporting. Where the issue was, um, this shows the patterns of a problem very visually, and a team can discuss it and quickly get an insight that there's a problem in the Northeast. And you get a different answer doing that than if you try to sort the, the worst flights. Uh, they're not all in the Northeast. Uh, the problem is when they group together. And that's another example of uh, getting something that, because of the visual reporting and analysis capability, the, the ability to in, in a, act with it on the fly in a meeting to answer questions that come up you kill the cycle of pain, and it leads to better and faster decision making. OK, so uh, back to Wayne's report, because we've seen a couple of good examples of dashboards uh, here, dashboard design. And um, it really is a balancing act. So a good dashboard in, involves a very clean design. And uh, what we mean by that is that it's not too dense, uh, so that the pages are overwhelming with too much information. And yet it's not too sparse so that the information on the page doesn't let you get to the detail that you need to know in order to take action. Uh, you've seen a good combination of strong uh, graphical visualizations, which uh, really help you see the stories hidden in the data, as well as the text, which is what we're all used to seeing. And it's, the text is really helpful in allowing us to get to the list that we need in order to take action. And then um, finally, we've seen uh, some good high-level summary information on our pages, as well as the ability to uh, drill down and, and click in to get the detail, whether it was an individual flight segment or an individual donor. We, in uh, following Wayne's rule of get to the detail in three clicks or less, we certainly were able to do that. You did a good job of showing that, Doug. Well, thanks. And this uh, actually at the bottom, this screenshot uh, is a example of what we would call a pretty good best practices in layout, where you have a, a chart that's visually showing a, a, in a range of data. And you care about the relative magnitude, and you care about how big this is. And it shows that really clearly. As you saw, you could select on it. But right on the right, we have the actual list of the people. And this is what you know end users get grounded in. And we find that with just the charts by themselves, it becomes conceptual, and it's hard to really understand what's going on. And with just the, the detail, you can't see the patterns. And the two together are, are what are the really the powerful combination. I think Wayne did a good job of capturing that in his report. We also generally want to have some statistics. How many, how much is this worth? You know, how far off the metrics are we on this page as well? Great. Well, here's another example from uh, one of our customers who uses visual analysis for sales pipeline analysis. Our sales analysis includes a powerful, at-a-glance visual dashboard that quickly identifies pipeline issues, trends, and opportunities, and easily creates PowerPoint, Excel, and Access files for company-wide analysis and communication. Its strongest point is that you can click on one thing and immediately see the interactions with other things. No more fumbling with reports. And I'd like to just point out in this, uh, this easily creates and shares with PowerPoint, Excel, and Access, because I think this is one of the key principles that when you do work uh, with a visual reporting or analysis tool, you need to be able to get the, uh, the insights and the results out into things that are used, like PowerPoint and Word documents and PDFs and maybe HTML posts or whatever. And um, I think the, the better uh, offerings in this market do that and let you, like in a click or two, get the stuff right into where you want to have it. And also, as we saw before, get the data out, because at some point you actually need the list to take action on. So let's look at uh, an example of a sales pipeline uh, uh, tool. Then open up another web-based uh, uh, project. Uh, this loads directly from Salesforce.com. I'm just going to run through the pages. The first page is a list of opportunities. They're detailed here. There's some summary stats about how many there are and what they total in revenue. There's some filters uh, so you can you know, cut it down. 
So the next page uh, has a more typical report layout uh, by close month, and this can go up the quarter down to day, by owner, by stage, uh, total amount. So this is a more graphical view of that same data. Uh, we, we started this one with a more traditional reporting view because people are used to it. But this is showing you the spread of opportunities by size. And there's a couple of deals up here at the top uh, that are, are big, like uh, Southwest Airlines for 63,000. Uh, but you know, it drops to 30,000 pretty quick with only maybe 10% of the deals over that, then it falls off. So this, this shows you the deals in, in a very different way and it creates insight. The next page is expected revenue, uh, which is the same thing, only the factored amount. And then timing and probability, uh, we'll come back at this, but this has some kind of really powerful views about where these deals are and moving through stages. Opportunity attributes, um, this is showing you know, by um, type, by lead source location. This is a hierarchy, so it can go from uh, state to city. And by the way, coloring throughout is set on uh, probability. So we're using color. Uh, red is low probability, and the cooler colors are the high probability. So we're stacking the colors in. So it gives you some quick insight that if something's you know, uh, skewed, you see a lot more red, it's higher probability. Here's opportunity owner portfolio. Uh, uh, so yeah, as you can see by the staff, you know, Brenda's got lower priority, a lower probability deal. Sally's got a lot more, and they're moving along. Uh, there's another more metrics-based approach with some goal lines to see where people are against targets. And we have a page on the right on partners. Where are these deals coming from? So um, can let's uh, do the same thing here and take a take a scenario and try to answer a question with this. All right. So I let's pretend that I'm the VP of Sales and I'm approaching the end of my quarter, and I really want to get a handle on, on what's going on. So uh, how would I use a tool like this, Doug, to? Well, first you said end of the quarter, so we probably want to go to the timing and probability of page. So again, this is organized in themes, the timing and probability page um, as a chart which shows closed quarter, and uh, we're, in, we're in Q4. So I'm going to again click Q4, which is going to drop the data down to just the deals in Q4. I'm going to get rid of everything else. And then this is a hierarchy, so I can click here and drill down. Uh, let's look at the month, um, and I can quickly see that Q4, you know, most of the deals are coming in in December. Um, so yeah. we've got to get on this. Yeah, so let's take a look at December. Okay, let's grab December that's, here and get rid of everything else. Looks uh, like that's going to really break or make or break my quarter. Right, it's, it's almost all of it. So, okay, so we've got this colorful uh, probability chart on the left. Um, let me take a look at some of these high probability deals. I want to know if they're for real or not. Yes, yeah, so let's do, what this chart is, it's showing months in the pipeline, uh, so zero uh, up to 30. Uh, and then probability, you, you expect the deals to progress over time to higher probability. Obviously, some of them haven't. You could explore that. Uh, some of them have. And each circle, if I put the mouse on a circle, uh, for example, this deal is, uh, for the web to catch up, is uh, Comcast. Uh, so it's a specific opportunity. Sally Lott owns it. It's a $50,000 deal. It's been in the pipeline 28 months, which is pretty long, uh, and it's got a, a probability of 85%. So each of these are uh, opportunities. Okay. So let's look at those uh, opportunities. Let's select all of the opportunities that are 60% or greater. Okay. That's easy enough to do. And again, this, this chart uses, you know, size and color and layout to help identify uh, the portfolio. I could just sweep over the chart. This is all web-based with a mouse and get rid of everything else. I'm down to, uh, you know, it looks like 18 deals, uh, totaling $457,000 that are scheduled to close It's December uh, that are over 60%. Okay. So I'd like to know uh, which of my reps actually own these deals. So we go to the Opportunity Owner Portfolio page. Uh, this is updated, and it looks like Sally's got half of them, and then the rest of the team uh, have a smaller percentage of them. If I want to see Sally, I could click on Sally here, and it looks like she's got you know, six deals totaling 253000 a gross, and here are the list of the deals. Okay. So uh, let's go back to the list then. Can, is there a way that I can get that information out so I can uh, shoot it over to Sally and have her give me an update on Right. So I go back to the opportunity list. So this page is dropped from everything. Now it's just showing the six deals. And I can uh, go down to the bottom here and just click through and export this out to uh, my desktop in Excel. And I've got the list uh, out of Advisor with whatever relevant fields I want. So that's uh, another good example of um, the use of visual reporting, 
to see a pattern. Uh, you can click to discover things and drill into it and then do analysis to untangle uh, you know, what's going on. And we could have uh, continued that because one question might be, why are there all these deals down here that are low probability that have been out over 20 months? Again, you could select that and explore it. So this is really a very open and an ad hoc exploration uh, solution that lets you, again, you know, kill the cycle of pain. You're doing this on the fly, speed of thought. It's not going back to queries in the database. You, you don't have to involve other people. And end users are doing this and answering their own questions in a collaborative manner. I guess that's one of the, to summarize the key benefits of this is uh, it breaks down the cycle of pain. And as in this case, a couple people could sit in a room and bounce ideas around. This could be a manager. It uh, happens all the time going into a meeting uh, with his bosses and uh, the board or whatever. And, and you've got the data there so you can answer their questions on the fly um, with the full set of data in memory. Um, to summarize and conclude, uh, there's five types of problems that we see visual reporting and analysis apply to. Uh, list reduction, which you saw in, in several of the examples, certainly the, the Dartmouth example on prospect identification was that. Uh, portfolio analysis, the airline example, uh, you're trying to understand out of this portfolio of flights, where do I need to focus? And this could also be assets. Um, people, projects, proposals, uh, we're doing some work to identify you know, uh, performance, uh, who are high paid, low performers in a, in a team of a couple hundred thousand in a large company. It's great for that because you can see what makes up uh, that group. And that sort of gets into outlier detection. You find anomalies and unexpected behaviors, customer behavior, staff performance, project, pro project progress, uh, medical claims issues time series. We saw a little bit about that, but there's a lot more you can do to look at trends over time and uh, be able to cut the data apart to see the overall trend is going up, but what is not going up within it and, and what makes that different than everybody else. And quantitative analysis has not been part of today's uh, discussion, but uh, there are charts we have that will show you know, statistical uh, patterns. Uh, we have predictive analytics, so back in if it's the issue of who are my high paid, low performers on my team, You've got 200,000 people. You can run regression-based modeling right off the data that's in memory, and it will mine against the tables and tell you that you know that group is that's driven by maybe a seniority on the team, uh, maybe what type of group they're in, and so forth. And then you can score on the fly the population to identify others in a similar situation. And this, these visual reporting and analysis tools are leveraging new technologies. Uh, In-memory data management is key. And you saw several examples where we had multiple tables, and you saw how they interacted together. Data visualization, because you have to be able to see the data in, in clear and um, in, in powerful ways. And then the predictive modeling complemented, as we just discussed. That concludes uh, uh, the formal webinar. Uh, we, are, and we have uh, time now for a Q&A session. Thanks, Doug. That was great. Uh, yeah, so we'd love, we'd love to hear your questions. Uh, you can use the chat panel. Send them in. Um, Twitter, hashtag VizAnn, or raise your hand and we can unmute you now. Uh, once again, this webinar is being recorded and we will make the slides available to you uh, within the week. We need a little bit of time maybe to uh, get it posted. Also, um, we would love to have you continue the, the discussion on our blog, and you see the address there on the screen. And any uh, questions that we aren't able to answer in the course of this webinar, uh, we will be sure to get back to you personally. And if you have additional questions as you think about the information you heard today, feel free to email doug.cogswell at advisorsolutions.com. I'd be glad to answer them. Great. So do we have any questions? Uh, there is a question. Here's one. Uh, how does this compare with reporting systems like Cognos or Business Objects? So, yeah, we hear that a lot. Um, and we actually, um, one of our partners has put together a paper on that, which we can share. If you, you let me know, I can get you that. But generally, yeah, uh, most of our accounts have, obviously, reporting. Uh, Cognos Business Objects, Microsoft Reporting Services, or whatever. And that is mostly about producing information in a, in a structured, formatted way. Uh, it, can, it can create a lot and index it well, so you have some drill down and, and cross drill capability. But it, it does not have this whole ad hoc discovery and, and visual selection capability that you saw today. And we would say we complement really well in this category of products our data discovery and analysis as opposed to reporting and scorecarding. And they, they give you this ability to do this sort of speed of thought ad hoc analysis, you know, query anywhere across any set of tables without having to go back to have work done in the database to prepare. And on the analytics side, you know, we have when you're running our modeling, um, if uh, you 
for example, uh, take a, take the Dartmouth-like example. Uh, maybe uh, you you're trying to find large donors, and there's factors in other tables that aren't in the, the people table, um, like maybe which activities they went to or uh, things like that. In in a, in a non-memory approach, somebody's got to go back and do something on the table to get those factors in the people table. In our world, you can quickly calculate a metric in the activities table and, and copy it back to the core table, run the model against it, and see if it matters. So that whole um, um, ability is just much more flexible, and um, I would use the word flexible and end user oriented um, to, to do this kind of discovery and analysis. So another question, we actually have several versions of this question, but um, it's, it's all about how hard is it to set up one of these projects that would allow you to get to the answers that you need to know. OK, so there's sort of a couple of answers to that, sorry. <laughs> the, the first one is, if you're an individual user uh, running you know, Excel or Access and you've got a table or two, um, we actually have an a individual analysis offering called Office Advisor, um, which you can find at www.officeadvisor.com. We'll take you right there. It, it's five minutes. And, and if we had more time, I could show you how you would do that. But it's very easy to load a table in, set some charts up, and, and do analysis. If you're a, a departmental user um, and you've got you know, 100 tables in the Oracle warehouse uh, that are, there's some um, core tables, there's a bunch of descriptive, there's a bunch of fact tables, and those tables need to be linked and joined, and there's metrics that have to be calculated. Um, we usually would do a service project with that, and, but it's, it takes us um, probably um, five to ten days of services to get one of those up and going, and uh, we could have it fully implemented. Uh, you know, this will be a lapse over four to eight weeks. Up and running, refreshes from the data, usually daily, could be more often, uh, so this is production version of one of these. It updates every day, and end users can then access either over the web, you saw the web version, or, or clients. Uh, so to summarize, an individual analyst can be up, have something up and going in five minutes. Uh, a departmental app that's going out to 50 people, you know, I'd say four to eight weeks. It's a lot faster than a typical platform BI system because our whole approach to how to organize the data is this, and run it in memory is more flexible and, 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 and dynamic. Okay. Great. Uh, we actually have Roy Schulte has uh, raised his hand. So, um, Doug, if you want to unmute him. Yeah, sure. Let me uh, give this a try. So, Roy, I'm going to try to unmute you. Uh, actually, he needs to uh, enter a... Roy, I can't unmute you. You have to enter a, a PIN number. So if you do pound 454 pound, what came up with that? Pound four five four pound. Uh, you should be able to then. Uh, I can unmute you, and it looks like there's another hand up. She's unmuted. Uh, Art Held uh, is is in. So Art, if you have a question, uh, hi uh, Doug. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh great. Okay. I also sent the question in uh, online, so you can ignore that. Um, you uh, made some nice comments and try to help us here to compare and contrast versus Cognos and. Um, so forth. Um, could you do the same for Spotfire? How, how would you say you compare or contrast to a Spotfire type of uh, approach? Yeah, so um, good question. Spotfire is, uh, there's a category of products or vendors that are in this realm. Uh, Spotfire would be probably the closest to us in the fact that they have a good in-memory capability. They've got a, um, a reasonably good front-end visualization capability. Uh, we've come at the market from, you know, I'm not going to speak for them per se, but their history has been uh, coming at it more from um, research uh, pharmaceutical areas. We come at this more from general business problems. And um, we have a lot in common, um, but we kind of, uh, I would say we have uh, sort of a more general approach. And uh, our, I would say, especially with our office stuff, some of our startup, what we're doing with analytics is, is, is pretty special. I don't obviously want to say comment on them directly, except that I would put them in the same category as us, and uh, you know, we would be um, normally looked at uh, together. All right, thank you. Yeah, Art, are you uh, unmuted? Uh, can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, I was just hoping maybe you could uh, expound a little bit on your ability to take individual members of a sales team and some of the different ways that you might be able to represent their performance graphically. Uh, what you did already mention was really interesting to us here, so 
just thought maybe you could give us another overview of uh, what would be available in that regard. Yeah, so good question. Let me back up and uh, go back to the, uh, the last demo, which has several, this one, uh, reopen it. So this, this project is about uh, sales pipeline and sales performance. And there's a couple of pages in here uh, that are about comparing the, uh, the different uh, sales staff. Uh, this one, and this is a small team. It's a, it's a demo data set. This is called a heat map. We're not getting a change yet on the screen. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, it's because I had paused for the Q&A. There we sorry. go. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks for calling me on that. Yeah, this is called a this is called a heat map. Um, so this is taking um, two levels of, of performance. One is so Sally Lot is sized by how much uh, revenue uh, she has in her pipeline, and she's colored by the uh, the average probability of what's in her pipeline. So what you'd like to see is big green boxes here. Um, Sally is a big um, box, so she's got a lot. She's not as far up in the uh, spectrum as, say, Dave Crenshaw, who's, who's the, the, the strongest, uh, but he's clearly better than these three. So you're actually looking at this. What would jump is I've got three people who are have smaller pipelines, and it's less far along. And I've got you know three that look like they're doing pretty well, and somebody in the middle. Um, this scales out better if you have a large team. This could be uh, subgrouped into regions, and if you could have a, several hundred, or we're doing this actually with uh, some stock portfolios and retail stores where you can have thousands of things in this. But uh, the concept is the same. We're using size and color to quickly highlight patterns. Um, and we've got some you know, really good examples of how this can communicate well to management. Uh, um, I'd like to just jump in on that, too, because I think it's, um, it's a, it, this, this particular chart is really helpful not only in uh, looking at, you know, are we going to reach our numbers, are our staff, um, you know, performing in the way that we expect, but uh, several of our customers are using this as a really good coaching tool to help improve the overall performance of their team. Right. Yeah, you don't want to be smaller and redder. Uh, a more traditional view of this, uh, this is basically the same data where we've laid it out in bar chart uh, with a metric. Uh, so there's a goal line here. You want to have 100 opportunities. It looks like three people do. You know, five don't. You want to have a dollar amount over, um, looks like, million dollars. Uh, you want the expected revenue. You want the average amount. Um, if you could, should be one here in probability as well. So this is another one where, uh, and you can grab the ones that have, I don't know, maybe the highest amount. It's going to change the coloring on the others. So they actually have the most opportunities, the most expected revenue, the average. They don't have the biggest deal sizes. Uh, they're actually in the middle. The ones with the bigger average deal sizes are actually have the smaller deals. Uh, so you can go back and forth this way as well. And a third one is um, we're, we're doing a lot of work with sort of on performance is this chart, which we looked at before, which is showing the basically the moves. There's a variety of ways, but this is showing individual deals, and it's on a you know time uh, probability. It could be time stage and their size. So there's a lot going on in here. But you, you could say, what are these you know deals over here? Uh, so we, these are the ones that sort of are stuck. Uh, so this is showing of a sales team its moves and I can come back over here who has them uh, it's coloring in now the out of everything the deals that are stuck and I see that you know Amy and uh, who's this Albert uh, and uh, and Glenn do a little of that have those deals and, and these people don't so I'm actually seeing that these people who are you know, so I'm cross comparing different aspects of performance so there's a lot of other things we can do but sort of our there's sort of three classical approaches to looking at um, a sales team, which would be the pool portfolio, uh, which would be something like this, comparing against set metrics, which could be activities, it could be a variety of things in a format like this, and then looking at uh, movement across time, and there's a trend line in here, you know, so some are getting like, further faster and some are getting hung up and slowed down. So uh, actually, Doug, to piggyback on that, one of the questions was, one of the questions uh, had to do with other use cases other than sales that you could uh, use this for? I think you mentioned briefly, but. Yeah, I, I would say we're doing uh, work in a variety of areas. If I go back to the uh, the use cases, probably go best around, um, put too many, too many PowerPoints and things open here. Uh, go back to this, this page. Um, it's these kinds of problems. Um, 
and they occur in a variety of industries. And we could give examples uh, in healthcare, uh, where we're doing a bunch of work on claims analysis, which would be outlier detection. We're also doing a lot of work in, in clinical and financial analysis in um, medical and radiation oncology clinics, because the issue there is you've got a lot of data. Uh, one example is wait times. Uh, what is driving higher, higher wait times? Uh, another one would be referring you know, physician revenue. Who's bringing in uh, the most referring revenue and which types of patients? So that's kind of this kind of stuff. Uh, we're doing a, a work in financial services and retail banking um, on promotion uh, and uh, uh, customer loyalty work. Uh, we're doing a, a bunch of work in um, human, res human resources, um, looking at teams of people on workforce skills and uh, pay versus performance, those kinds of things, which would be combinations of portfolio analysis and outlier detection. Um, I could keep going, but I, I think the, this kind of technology fits into these kinds of problems, and these problems are generally, you know, departmental level. They're not, it's not like an enterprise doesn't do this. A department within an enterprise has the issue of, you know, claims, uh, medical claims, uh, and this kind of uh, approach would be great for that. Uh, and, and then you go into uh, uh, a university. You know, with fundraising, there's a series of problems that fit into these, these areas. Uh, we saw one of them today. Uh, so that's probably how I would answer the question. It's, um, and if you have more specific situation, it would be great to discuss. And I think that the key point here is visual reporting analysis is departmental oriented for discovery and analysis, and it solves you know, these kinds of problems. It's not generally you know, something you would put out generally to a whole enterprise. It would be tailored into those areas. Great. Uh, we actually have a hand raised. Courtney Greco. Hello? Hey, we can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep, let's, time for the question. We, we want to see if there's... We're getting, a, we're getting a lot of echo. Yeah, we, we uh, whatever that phone line, Courtney, was getting a, a lot of echo, so we've uh, muted you back up. I'm not sure why, um, but um, if you put the question in in the question line or, or email us, we'll, we'll get it. Um, other questions? Uh, we have... Several questions around data, um, uh, how you connect to the data system. Is it is it in the demos you showed? Is that a live connection, or how does the data feed into the project? We've had questions about size of uh, data sets that can be used in the project. Okay, so uh, there's several questions there. Advisor uh, has uh, connectors to load data from things like Excel, Oracle, SQL Server, Salesforce.com, uh, ODBC to MySQL, Pervasive, uh, Access. Uh, we also load text files, uh, CSV or tab delimited. So if there's uh, unusual databases or not one of them we have a connected to, we'll often load exported text files. Um, we, uh, so we, have two forms. We create project files. There's two forms of them. One of them uh, loads data when it opens. So, so an author would build one of these things. Uh, and there's a wizard to load in. You know, first table, second table, third table, fifth table. A whole view might come in with 20 tables at once. Uh, you save the project uh, after you've built it out. You've seen several, three examples today. And the project has a definition of where all the data came from when it was built and what's on the pages. And if it's say we have two formats, an ADV format. When that project reopens, it'll go back and reload the data on demand from wherever it all came from. And it can be multiple sources. So in some cases, we might load 10 tables from an Oracle database, you know, six tables from a SQL Server database, two Excel sheets, bring them all into memory, and then we have um, wizards to define links, copies. We can do roll-ups, create calculated metrics, all that once the data's in. There's another form of a project of so you can save the project as an ADVM, which actually saves it with the data embedded in it. So if you made a project and saved it that way, it would not update when somebody opens it. It would be the snapshot, and it would not hit the database again. And in production, what we typically do, um, this is you know, analysis. It's generally not real time. Um, we would set a timer somewhere. Usually it's once a day. It could be six times a day. It could be once a week. That timer would kick off the ADV form of our file, let's say 3 in the morning, it goes loads the data from the different sources, 
and then saves it as an ADVM project on a file server, which then our web offerings and our client offerings open. At that point, if it's a client offering, a client use, it's like open a big Excel spreadsheet. It just opens up and brings all the data into memory and loads the project. Uh, Size-wise, uh, we, put, we put all the data in RAM. Uh, we're not swapping it. That's why it's fast. We are loading uh, on a four gigabyte footprint. Uh, we just were looking at a project yesterday that had a million customers, uh, seven million transactions, uh, 45 tables that probably total 30, 40 million rows and fits in about four gigs on RAM. We've got some customers that are larger uh, running us on servers, you know, 16, eight gig servers. You can obviously scale up. Um, you know, for a single, if you're putting Excel in, it, it, a footprint typically going to be 50, 100 megs is going to be small. Uh, but these large Oracle SQL Server database loads with you know, tens of millions of records, um, you know, it could be 4 gigs, could be 8 gigs, something like that. If it's an entire warehouse with you know a trillion transaction records, uh, we can execute a SQL command on the load. We'd probably roll up. So it, it wouldn't be at the transaction level. We might roll up uh, to the hour or the day level or something to collapse the data. You're, you're not going to put you know a trillion records in. Uh, in an in-memory product like this, um, you know, obviously you can swap to disk, but but you, we would want the whole thing in memory, and you'd roll up at that point. That was like three or four questions in there. That's good. That's good. Uh, I know we're running late on time, but just a final one. But we still have a lot of people on, so I, I'd say if we have. It looks like we still have a hundred and something people on, so I, I think we we can keep going. Uh, we're okay. We can go another ten or fifteen minutes, and if people you know, want to drop, uh, drop. Uh, but we're still getting questions, so I'd say keep going. Okay. Uh, so another question is, if we already have a BI platform set up, does it take less time to set up the visual aspect? Yeah, I mean, the if you have a BI platform set up, and if you have a data warehouse with formatted data, uh, it, it's actually really easy. It's more the individual analysis scenario where you can just load a table uh, and and work with it. Uh, and if the tables are well formatted, it's easy enough to add, you know, an individual end user could bring in a couple, two, three tables, link them together, and work with them. Um, if you have, it, so there's sort of more what form is the data in. If it's fairly formatted in a warehouse, uh, the setup is really not that much setup. If the data is in more transaction tables, so what we often find when we put a project in is uh, the data is, uh, you know, you've got, <laughs> you have, Stuff stuck in tables that somebody stuck in ten years ago that nobody actually knew that has to be removed. You've got you know descriptions that aren't in the tables. You've got transaction calculations that haven't aren't in the table with the customers or in you have to calculate on the transaction table. So that that's sort of the setup I was talking about earlier, where it takes us usually five to ten days of services time to get we will do that work. Uh, and then uh, that sort of elapses over four to eight weeks. So we work with some pretty ragged database tables sometimes. In other cases, we hit really clean warehouses. We try to figure that out up front before we, we start down one of these paths. But uh, that's probably the ends of the spectrum. OK. And just, just in that, I mean, we are, so if we bring raw tables into memory. We can do a number of things. Uh, so if, say there's a transaction table with, with six million transactions, and you're trying to get purchase totals by customer. We can, in the memory pool, create another table, which is a roll-up of the transaction table. So we can roll up on customer and sum the transactions so we'll get the total. We can find the minimum transaction, the maximum transaction. Uh, we can do calculations in the transaction table. Um, if there's like different codes and transactions and you want to code out, you could do it. if this code, then put we create a new column with just that. So we also, once we get the data, if it's raw, there's a lot we can do in the, the memory pool to create these calculations, um, do things with tables to create summaries, and then it's saved in our project definition. So when the thing reloads, it, it, re, it redoes all of that and recreates it off the new data that just came in with the updates. OK, that actually leads to the next question. Um, as you're talking about data and raw data, what if we don't have we don't have the data, or what if our data is not in the kind of shape that we believe it could be used for this kind of a tool? Can you speak to that data yeah. quality? Well, so a couple of things there. I mean, uh, uh, one of the I think unintended. We had a user group in the fall uh, here in Chicago, and one of the unintended benefits that almost everybody talked about this is a great tool for understanding problems with the data. Uh, you'll see tables that you think have fields filled in that don't. 
uh, we're very good at looking at mismatches between the tables. So sometimes you've got you know, the customer table, which is supposed to be all the customers, but then the transaction table has a bunch of IDs or customers in it that aren't in the customer table. And so if you picture this cross-linking the way we do the tables, you can select in the one and you'll see the rows and the other that aren't lighting up. And we, we have capabilities. We, we can look back and forth across tables and find a lot of that. So one thing is if the data is really messy, this is actually a really good exploration tool to understand kind of what's misaligned, where's there problems with these tables, where are there fields that aren't filled in. Uh, it's very visual at doing that. And we have actually some clients who have bought Advisor just to do that. Um, the, uh, I went off on that side. What was the other part? Uh, I, think, I think maybe more in line with the expression builder and uh, what you can do to create metrics and create uh, information from data that's already existing. Yeah, I, I'm going to actually, I could show you that the easiest way. I'm just going to open a project. Uh, there's something in here called the uh, project uh, workshop, which is, so this is, this is I'm in a project. Um, this, this is the back end where it's showing me I've got, you know, 18 tables loaded where they all came from. And there's this whole thing about uh, calculations. So this table has a whole bunch of calculations in it. If I click on one, it should give me what they are. Uh, so this is in use, uh, the employment table, a C-level job, if, you know, there's an if then, if the position level equals NA, then no, so there's all these, so this is, this is the back end where these things have already been done. If I want to calculate an expression, uh, manage calculations, a wizard comes up, um, rather than sh create one, I, it works off tables, it's got a set of operations, uh, arithmetic, uh, it does these kinds of things. Uh, this is all just in here, uh, logical, uh, this makes some sense. I've got different functions. I can do conversions. I can do uh, conditionals. I can do math stuff. Uh, I've got a bunch of string calculations, which often we end up with, we, we expect to find codes, but they're in full text strings, so we can you know, match, find matches in strings, substrings, so we can do a lot in here with the data that comes in. Uh, just to show you how this would work, uh, pick a table. Uh, um, entity. If I want to create a new field, uh, I'm just going to make it and stick a, you know, one plus one. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm using up too much time here, but one plus one, one. I can go down here. I type the expression one plus one. Uh, value is a pretty simple expression. <laughs> Figures out it's two. It stuck a new uh, new expression, and in that table is now going to have uh, uh, that, that field 1 plus 1 is going to be a new field in the table from that expression that then all the charts can use. It can be copied to other tables and so forth. So I went a little deep, but I want to show, uh, since the question came up, that there's this pretty rich back end uh, on this, uh, you know, where I can uh, do these, cro these calculations. There's a bunch of cross-table links. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, hierarchies I can set up um, and, and, and parse dates. So, this is back to, if the data is raw, there's a whole lot. We have a pretty complete um, project workshop uh, that can, can deal with all of that. Great. Um, we looks like we have several Razor's Edge users on the webinar, and um, they have just a question about whether or not we work with Razor's Edge. Uh, yes, we have worked with Razor's Edge. Uh, I would say for those of you that Razor's Edge is a, uh, a fundraising uh, ERP source system, um, the tables are a little... Tougher than, tougher than some of the other vendors, but yeah, we've 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 worked successfully at Razor's Edge, and conceptually, it's actually uh, mostly it's in the fundraising. Razor's Edge, Banner, Advanced, Millennium, Datatel, uh, Genzibar, uh, conceptually are all the same. It's just the tables are called different things, and Razor's Edge is particularly tricky because there may be uh, the same ID number labeled differently in uh, in different tables, so you have to sort of untangle all of that. But yeah, we we have a to raise the edge in, in, in implementation going on right now with a large uh, microfinance bank, uh, which is uh, a whole bunch of tables. It, they're not in a warehouse. We're pulling the raw raise the edge tables, and uh, it's fine. It's you know in that five to ten days of kind of services to untangle that, and that's the kind of work. Well, we can train you to do it, but we generally prefer to do that because we are very quick at that and know what we're doing and have done, especially in the fundraising. That whole table line up multiple times. Great. Uh, there's a, some questions about mapping, and um, this is one in particular for the mapping capabilities. Do the longitude and latitude need to be stored in the data? And is there mapping via zip code? Uh, 
so yeah, this is as we saw this. This is another. This is a client version map. Uh, the map uh, comes with. Uh, let me open up the map wizard. Um, so um, you have fields and tables. Uh, it, it comes with uh, latitude and longitude for U.S. cities and states. Uh, this is this is getting updated. Uh, oh, here's locations. It comes with uh, for U.S. city and state, U.S. zip international cities, Canadian cities and provinces. It comes with a lat lawn. Um, you can also put your old lat lawn in, uh, and it comes with a set of maps. Um, you can you know, add your own maps to it. So we've got basic US maps, but it's pretty easy to put in any uh, rectangular, actually any rectangular image can come in as a map. Uh, we have people who have put in you know, maps of specific cities. Campus maps uh, can go in here. Um, um, we have put logical maps in, floor plan maps. So, yeah, this to summarize, the map is uh, we're plotting data on a map. Um, uh, in this case, you know, it's cities and it's, these are these are people. Uh, the map can be any image. We just we're plotting the data. And then data when it's on the map is interactive uh, to the map. So if you select things, you know, here it, it shows up uh, in the other charts. And if I go to another chart, uh, I know grab. Uh, grab uh, next reunion and just grab something here. The map's going to update to show where the people in the next reunion are uh, out of everybody. And, and so that's, uh, yeah, we do, we do have that capability, obviously, to put the Latin launch. They come with it. And actually, they come with it as of the product that's shipping like next week. Our 5.7 version comes with Latin launch. On new release. Yep. So, Doug, we're, we're well over an hour now. Um, yeah. We still, have, we still have like 100 people on, so I'd say one more question, and then uh, we'll let everybody go get lunch or whatever else uh, they're, they're up to doing. Uh, well, there's another question about data prep and, and data modeling. Uh, what level of data modeling is required to support this kind of an application? Can I work directly from uh, OLTPDB records? Do I need to build an OLAP warehouse? Uh, what performance hits are inherent with these, these choices? Yeah, we we prefer to load relational tables, uh, rows and columns. Uh, so if there if there's an OLAP uh, uh, structure, we prefer to get the base tables and uh, work from from there. Is typically what we're doing. Uh, and they most often we're loading you know relational tables out of Oracle or SQL Server. If it's individual uses, it's Access Excel. Um, probably be the most common things we're loading from. Okay. Um, we've talked about fundraising. You've talked about other client environments that we've worked mm -hmm. in. Yep. Um, Any other hot questions? Otherwise, I'd say uh, let's uh, let's conclude and let, let people uh, get on with their day. Um, maybe there's some several questions about how we compare to different uh, competitors. And so I don't know if you want to maybe just kind of sum up some of um, you mentioned spot fire. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'd say the thing we do, you know, uniquely What's well. Part? Yeah, it's the combination of the in-memory backend. Uh, I'd say we're best of breed at the ability to bring in significant amounts of data and, and, and link it together in a very flexible way. There's a company, ClickTech, that's got a, a, a strong in-memory backend. Uh, their approach to working with the tables is more automated. Ours, we have a, a wizard, so you set up the keys, but there's times when you know, you need to have determine what keys between the tables, and we can go into more detail. But I, I think, you know, and, and if you look at us versus them, and the report actually talks a bit about this, they're more visual reporting, more more visual analysis and discovery. Uh, our charts, uh, I'd say the collection of charts we have, we have 15 of them, is is, is unique. Uh, you saw some of them in the demos, but we're very strong on how to display the data. And then um, we didn't really go into today, but the predictive analytics capability where you can on the fly, build a model against this data. Nobody has else really has integrated that with the whole visual discovery and the in-memory data the way we have. Uh, and we've got some very robust uh, multivariate regression algorithms in this. So, I mean, to summarize, uh, yeah, there's a lot of reporting. There's a lot of uh, charting. There's a lot of scorecarding uh, products on the market. I think where we our strength is in this whole visual data discovery and analysis and enabling end users to um, see trends, understand things in their data, uh, work with it in flexible ways, and get quickly to answers. And so, and it's those, back to those, uh, I was actually to conclude, I say uh, it's, uh, it's these problem types um, 
which is where our home is and our focus. Uh, and, uh, and this whole category uh, fits these kinds of things really well. So this is not, you know, again, this is not something you use everywhere. Uh, it's where there are these kinds of problems, and there's a lot of them out there. And it's where people are trying to slice and dice data, explore things. Um, you know, having the same the same day sales report every day in the morning is great, but that's not enough. They need to now understand what happened here and why. That's that's where these category of products come in. Um, and we mentioned us and uh, two others uh, on this call, which I think Wayne also uh, referenced. And uh, we would generally, you know, those three companies would be the three that would be most put in the same category. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank all of you for your attendance. We've had huge interest in this webinar, and we will be following up. Uh, also, thank you so much for the many, many questions that have come in. Doug, if you could put the slide off of um, the end of the webinar slide, because uh, we will be following up with each of you personally, but we will also be posting those questions on our blog site, uh, which you see there towards the end of the slide, continues the discussion. So uh, I would encourage you to visit that um, to uh, see what others are asking and to get answers to, to, and to read the answers to all of the questions. Once again, we thank you so much for your time today. Uh, uh, watch for our next webinar. We, we host pre-webinars uh, several times each year, and we'll look forward to talking with you again. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks.